On November 18, 2001, Johnny Riddle was out picking up cans in a cow pasture in Fort Worth, Texas, when he made a shocking discovery. Wrapped in a jacket was the body of a newborn baby girl with the umbilical cord still attached. When the local police arrived, they collected evidence from the scene that included a smashed key fob, a tobacco spit cup, and a Coke bottle. They were hoping those items could one day be used for DNA testing. An autopsy determined that the baby was born alive, but bled to death because her umbilical cord was not clamped. Unable to identify the infant, she became known as Angel Baby Doe. Investigators spent years trying to learn the mother's identity, but all attempts left them empty-handed. Finally, in 2022, they enlisted the help of Othram, and by the following year, they had identified the mother as 48-year-old Shelby Stotts. On July 1, 2024, Stotts was arrested and charged with second-degree manslaughter. Stotts was an employee with the Cleburne Independent School District and worked at the high school not far from where the baby was discovered. After being arrested, the school district terminated her employment. Sadly, Stotts didn't take advantage of a law in Texas dubbed the Baby Moses Law that was passed in 1999. It allows mothers to safely leave their newborns with authorities and remain anonymous. If she had known or taken advantage of it, the baby would most likely be alive and she would have never been charged. Plus, from what I can tell, she now has a family and three daughters. As of July 2024, Stotts remains in jail, awaiting the outcome of her case. Holly Ann Williams was born in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, on January 14, 1987. Holly and her mother never quite saw eye to eye, and by the time she was an adult, they were estranged from each other. In 2020, 33-year-old Holly was now living in Nashville and was described as an outgoing individual who was also very attractive and charming. Unfortunately, in order to earn extra money, she got a job as an escort and went by the name Layla Love. Around the same time, Holly was in an on-and-off-again relationship with a man named William Lanway, who went by Bill. Bill grew up in Clarksville, Tennessee, and worked as an auto mechanic. Just like Holly, he had a very outgoing personality and was described by friends as the life of the party. They met in 2018 during the CMA Music Festival, and like other men in her life, she was very open and honest about her secret life. Unfortunately, due to their similar personalities, their relationship was very tumultuous, and they spent a good amount of their time fighting. Eventually, the relationship turned abusive, and Holly had to call the police on him at least three times. At that point, she was done and broke off the relationship, but Bill remained in her apartment for several months. Once he left, she installed security cameras to obtain proof that he was breaking in. He even tried to strangle her in January 2020, so she got a restraining order taken out against him. Another time, he allegedly took her dog, Max, and several days later, she found him dead on the side of the road near her apartment. Bill had a traumatic event in his life when he was just three years old. On November 23, 1986, Bill's father, Lyle Lanway, held him hostage with a 22 caliber rifle for five hours before police were finally able to take him into custody. All this was because Lyle wanted Bill's mother, Candy, to return from shopping. Four days later, Lyle was given a day pass from the stress unit of Memorial Hospital and went right to Candy's home. Once inside, he stabbed Candy and her friend, Jerry Beard. While Jerry survived the attack, Candy wasn't so lucky and died the following day at the hospital. For the attack, Lyle was given life in prison plus 37 years. While it might explain Bill's behavior, it is still no excuse, but unlike his father, he would never resort to murder. In early February 2020, Holly's customer, Eric Mond, whom she had previously been with once before, contacted her and said he was coming to Nashville to visit his son on the weekend of February 5th and wanted to book time with her. The weekend went fine, and he returned home on February 7th, 2020. Less than a month later, on March 1st, Bill broke into Holly's email account and stole her list of clients. He then found Eric's information and decided to extort him for $25,000. 46-year-old Eric was a married man from a very renowned family. 
his grandfather, started the Mond Automotive Group and Mond Toyota, and eventually, Eric took over the business. He lived with his family in a 10-bedroom, $5 million home that backed up to the sixth hole at Austin Country Club in Austin, Texas. So he definitely had the money to pay Bill, but the extortion attempt didn't go quite as planned. On March 13, 2020, a construction worker called 911 to report that a white Acura had crashed into a tree. When law enforcement arrived, they strangely found Bill and Holly shot to death. They, along with many in the community, assumed Bill had murdered Holly and then took his own life. But over the next two years, investigators would untangle one of the craziest murder cases they had ever seen. Investigators eventually discovered Holly's camera system and went through the footage. That's when they found something interesting that was recorded a few days before the murders. In the footage, three unidentified men approached her apartment and repeatedly knocked on her door. They also tried messing with the outdoor camera in an attempt to conceal their identities. At the same time, Holly could be seen on her security cameras inside, clearly terrified and refusing to open the door. Around that same time, they learned of Holly's secret life as an escort. Now they just needed to identify the men, so they began going through Holly and Bill's phone records and discovered one number in both of their records that traced back to a voiceover IP telephone that is typically found in office buildings. They can also be used to try to hide a caller's identity, but they can be traced back via their IP address. The phone number was eventually traced back to a man named Adam Carey, a former Marine with special ops training who now worked in private security. He also had a criminal record in North Carolina. Investigators were able to match his license photo to one of the men caught on Holly's security footage. It's worth noting that Adam had two unidentified associates with him helping to scope out Bill and Holly, but they were only involved in the surveillance portion. From there, they were able to track down a second man, a former Marine by the name of Brian Brockway. Apparently, the men had been hired to find out all they could about Bill. Brian had typed up a military-style document called a Situation Report detailing Bill and Holly's relationship. The document was turned over to a man named Gilad Peled, who went by Gil. Gil owned a private security firm called Spear Tip Security Group in Austin, Texas, and he consulted a Volkswagen dealership in Austin by none other than the Mond family. The consulting work was to get rid of a homeless problem the dealership was having. He also once worked as a bodyguard for Charlie Sheen. Gil had allegedly asked Brian's brother Chad, who also owned a security firm, to do a background check on Bill and Holly under the pretense that she was the daughter of a Nashville family and had been forced into sex trafficking. Once Chad returned the information, he thought it was all settled, but little did he know that his brother Brian had other plans. Gil wanted Brian to make contact with Bill and Holly, so he hired Adam, who went to Nashville and brought along two of his associates. Eventually, investigators traced the entire ordeal back to Eric. He wasn't happy about being extorted, so four days after Bill originally contacted him on March 5th, he paid Gil $15,000 to find out who was truly behind it. By March 9th, Gil had the situation report that was typed up by Brian and detailed Bill and Holly's relationship, as well as other information. The following day, on March 10th, Adam and two of his associates were called on Holly's surveillance system, knocking on her door and attempting to tamper with her outside camera. On March 11th, Bill called Eric at his home. This must have been the breaking point because later that day, he transferred $150,000 to Gil's account. Gil tried to talk Eric into going to the police, but he refused. Gil then told him that Brian had offered to murder them, and he agreed to that plan. The following day, Brian and Adam caught Holly and Bill as they were leaving her apartment in her white Acura. Bill was shot and killed first through the passenger side window. They then kidnapped Holly and drove her along with Bill's body to the construction site on Old Hickory Boulevard. Once there, they shot and killed Holly and staged the scene to look like a crash. Afterward, Adam drove Brian to the Memphis airport so he could fly back to Austin while Adam decided to drive the rest of the way. Remember the two associates who assisted Adam? Well, they were never privy to the murder-for-hire plot and agreed to wear a wire to get confessions from Adam and Brian. 
During one of those conversations, Brian revealed enough details to make investigators believe he was involved in the murders. On December 10th, 2021, Brian, Adam, and Gil were all three arrested. Gil then decided to help them get Eric. On a recorded call with him, he made several statements that implicated him in the crime and was subsequently arrested as he was driving home from a hunting trip at an exclusive South Texas ranch. In the end, Gil pleaded guilty to murder for hire and conspiracy to commit kidnapping and kidnapping resulting in death and agreed to testify against the other defendants. Gil said he only told Eric about Brian's offer to murder Holly and Bill for $100,000 each because he never thought he would agree to it. Gil later apologized and said that he would regret taking the money for the rest of his life. On November 17, 2023, Brian and Adam were found guilty of murder for hire resulting in death, conspiracy to commit kidnapping, and kidnapping resulting in death. Eric was also found guilty, but only for conspiracy to commit murder for hire. As of July 2024, they have yet to be sentenced, but all three are expected to receive life in prison. In 2022, 21-year-old Zachary Kent Mills of Spring, Texas, met a woman on the dating app Bumble. Her name has not been released, and she is only referred to as JW in court documents. On Christmas Eve 2022, Mills picked her up from her home, and she agreed to go back to his apartment with him. However, once there, he immediately tried to have sex with her, but she rejected his advances. This angered him, and he retaliated by beating her with his fist and a screwdriver. He also bit her on the neck and face. He then kept her locked in his apartment for five days, denying her access to food and water. She tried multiple times to leave, but Mills stopped her and punished her by assaulting her once again. On the fifth day, December 29, 2022, he left to visit his father, and she decided it was time to escape. Once he was gone, she gathered up her clothes and ran out his apartment door. She then went up to the first person she saw and informed them of what she had just gone through. After ending up at the Houston Methodist Spring Emergency Care Center, they called the police and reported the kidnapping and assault. While in the hospital, medical staff noted that she had severe bruising to both eyes, bite marks, cuts to both her throat and nose, and severe bruising to the majority of her body. Investigators showed her Mills, Texas driver's license photo, and she was able to make the identification. He was then arrested and charged with one count of felony aggravated kidnapping. However, his bail was only set at $50,000, and he was able to bond out because you only have to pay a bondsman 10% of that. Meanwhile, Mills and his attorney claimed there was more to this than the story JW told. They also claimed the two had been involved in a romantic relationship before Christmas Eve and said she had hung out with him, among other people, multiple times. I'm not sure how any of their claims justify what he did to her. Sadly, she would never get the justice she deserved because Harris County Criminal Court Judge Genesis Draper allowed him to take a plea deal and only sentenced him to two years of probation and 80 hours of community service. She also required him to make a $50 donation to a women's shelter and stay away from the victim. Plus, after his probation is over, he can have the charge dismissed. Kirsten Renee Hatfield was born in Oklahoma on February 12, 1989. In 1997, eight-year-old Kirsten was living in Midwest City with her mother, 26-year-old Shannon McCrossan, and younger sister, three-year-old Faye. Her family nicknamed her Curdle Birdle because she would stutter when she talked fast. She was described as a spirited character who hated cleaning her room. She loved climbing trees, playing horseshoes, riding roller coasters, and wearing frilly dresses. Unfortunately, tragedy would strike in late spring of that year. On May 13th, around 11.30 p.m., Shannon tucked Kirsten into bed. Sadly, that was the last time she would ever see her daughter. When she went to wake her up the next morning around 6 o'clock, Kirsten was nowhere to be found. In a panic, she began running to each house in the neighborhood looking for her. When she arrived back home and there was still no sign of her, she called the police. 
When investigators arrived, they found blood on the windowsill in the bedroom, on her underwear found in the backyard, and on the backyard fence. The blood was tested, but it didn't match Kirsten, meaning it likely belonged to her abductor. Investigators began thinking the suspect was someone close to the family because they didn't believe a person could have carried her out the window and over the fence without struggling or making noise. Investigators also considered the theory that her abduction was related to the occasional drugs Shannon admitted to using. However, she said her drug use was only in social settings and never around her children. Investigators began going door to door looking for a possible witness or suspect, but sadly came up empty-handed. After the abduction, Shannon moved back in with her father, and Faith's father was given custody. Shannon wasn't happy about the change in custody because she said Faith's father, who she was divorced from, never made an effort to be in her daughter's life. She said he never even sent a birthday card or Christmas present. In June 2015, a new investigator took another look at the case and realized they had untested DNA evidence. They just needed DNA to compare it against, so they went back and re-interviewed potential suspects. One of those suspects was a man by the name of Anthony Palma, who lived two doors down from Kirsten's home. In July of 2015, when investigators went to question him again, he stuck to his original story and said he was home all night. He then voluntarily gave them his DNA. Interestingly, he had convictions in the 80s that included assault with a dangerous weapon. One of those convictions was for when he broke into a woman's home and assaulted her in 1982. He is also a suspect in the sexual assault of another eight-year-old girl in 1979 or 1980. Palma was dating the girl's sister, and after the assault, police saw him parked nearby. However, due to a lack of evidence, he was never charged. Interestingly though, the suspect in that case entered through the girl's bedroom window, just like in Kirsten's case. Then, in 1998, a teenager who lived with him accused him of drugging and sexually assaulting her. She said when she woke up, she was in her underwear, in the bathtub, and Palma was standing over her. He wasn't charged in that case either. When investigators got the results for the DNA, it was a match to the DNA found at the crime scene. Palma was subsequently arrested and charged with first-degree murder. After being arrested, he unsuccessfully tried to take his own life. In the end, he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now that he was behind bars for good, they just needed to find Kirsten's remains. But unfortunately, that might never happen because 13 months later, he was beaten and strangled to death by his cellmate, Raymond Pilato. I'm not saying he didn't deserve what he got, but any hopes of him providing the location of Kirsten's remains are now lost. And as of July 2024, they've never been found. Mary Vivaretti was born in Nash County, North Carolina, on May 2, 1958, to parents Marvin and Geraldine Nelms. In 1986, 28-year-old Mary was the wife of Dennis Ray Vivaretti, and they had two children together. Unfortunately, a few days before Christmas, tragedy struck. On December 18, she went Christmas shopping at Golden East Crossing Mall in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. After leaving that day, her family never saw her alive again. When she failed to return home, Dennis went out looking for her and discovered her van still in the mall's parking lot at around 1.30 a.m. on December 19th. However, her keys, along with her driver's license, were missing. There were also bloody shoe prints found around the van. At that point, he called the Rocky Mount Police. Two days later, on December 20th, at about 5.30 p.m., a deer hunter found her body on State Road 1530 near Red Oak, a little over 10 miles from where she was abducted. She had tragically been sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. Now, investigators just needed to find her killer. A few weeks into the investigation, a man by the name of William Thomas Arrington called the police and said he might have Mary's driver's license. His wife had found the driver's license cut to pieces in her son, 23-year-old Tommy Arrington's driveway. Two days later, when police finally tracked Arrington down, he was brought in for an interrogation. 
During the interview, he claimed he knew Mary and had called her at her home at 7.30 p.m. and arranged to meet at the J.C. Penney at the Golden East Crossing. He said he arrived 15 minutes later and spoke with an employee inside until she arrived at 9 p.m. He said they then left together in her 1982 Chevy van. However, investigators had already confirmed that Mary had been at the shopping center when Arrington claimed they spoke over the phone. He then changed his story and said he surprised her that day. He said that once they were in her van, he drove her to the Browntown Road extension and pulled to the side. He then claimed they engaged in consensual sex. He said when an unidentified pickup truck passed them, it scared Mary and she hit him over the head with a bottle. He said when she wouldn't calm down and stop hitting him, he stabbed her in the face. Once dead, he said he stripped off her clothes and left her in a nearby ditch. He then drove the van back to the Golden East Crossing, emptied her pocketbook into the driver's side, and stole her money, driver's license, and vehicle keys to make it look like a robbery. He then cut up her license into tiny pieces and scattered them in his driveway. As for the bloody clothes he was wearing that day, he put them in a bag and hung them on a tree in the woods on the same road where he claimed he murdered Mary. As for the murder weapon, he threw the knife on the side of Quail Roost Road, and investigators were thankfully able to retrieve it. Arrington was then arrested and charged with first-degree murder, first-degree sexual assault, first-degree kidnapping, and armed robbery. In order to avoid the death penalty, he accepted a plea deal. He also cleared up some of the lies in his interrogation and finally admitted to abducting her at knife point. He also said the sex was not consensual and that he had held a knife to her head during the entire encounter. He also admitted to being the one who freaked out when the unidentified truck drove past them. That's when he stabbed her to death and dumped her body in a nearby ditch. In the end, Arrington was sentenced to two life terms in prison plus 130 years and remains there to this day.